second moment is, is the decision before us. Meaning, there are certain things that are in the way right now. There are certain things that are in the way right now in this moment. That is preventing us from getting beyond ourselves and really into the Christ life. There are certain things. Question open up. We are more open to suggestions when. Or fill in the blank, should I say. We are more open to suggestions when. Taken by surprise? No. Some people, that's that's like. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. You don't for, like for her, you don't taken like by surprise no. is a. No. <laughs> from the cross up there, and you're just ready to. I'll remember that. <laughs> for some people, that may be true. Okay. And, okay, so, and what I, what I, one thing that we're saying, it depends. We're more open to suggestions. Thing that we have tried doesn't work. Aren't we a little more up to suggestions at that point? You ever tried to do a project at home and you get to the end of yourself? Go. Good job. <laughs> We're more open to 
suggestions. That's what we're talking about, right? You know, we're in, you know, our emotions aren't out of control. Or, we're more open to suggestions when we, we've come to the end of ourself. We're more open to suggestions when... Uh, here's a clip. I'm Jakub, I'm from Sunset West South Africa, and this is my real life story of how I reconnected with God. I think about 1995 I decided that accepting Christ is the best thing to do. And uh, we led the life that we were supposed to, um, according to the word. I've married a nice girl. We had three children. I was close to the Lord. We did our quiet time, went to church on Sundays, and everything went well. And all of a sudden, stuff became important that was not important, like money. I started smoking all of a sudden, and then obviously along with that came the, the booze, alcohol. I started working long hours, my family never saw me. Yeah, sometimes it was days at a time at work, not going home, not missing my children, not missing my wife. So the fast cars, the booze became priority in life. Um, and I shut down from, from anything, anything else. I didn't go to church anymore. Quiet time was something of the past. And then uh, I lost my wife. Uh, I lost my children. I lost my house. I lost everything. I sat alone in the United States for two years, uh, working. And I decided I need to come back to South Africa, but now I cannot stay here because I don't have a job. For a little while I stayed with my brother until everything got too much dead, and then I stayed uh, with a friend of mine at a center where I started working as well. In 2009, during my office time, I went through my suitcase where everything I had was in it. I discovered a book, um, books names, and with balance. It was a Christian book with uh, scriptures in it. I started reading at the day's passage that uh, I read a piece there, and all of a sudden, you know, it was like years before when I gave my life to Jesus, and I said to him, here I am again, and he spoke to me again, you know, and I couldn't believe it, I mean, really? And uh, I heard the voice, and he said to me, what are you doing? He asked me twice, and I realized that was him speaking, and, uh, and everything just broke down again. So, he took me through a whole process of telling me what I did wrong, and uh, also telling me what I need to do to call everyone that I hurt and impossible for difference. The toughest one was calling my ex-wife to tell her that um, I messed up and I'm sorry. And the second toughest one was calling my dad because I mean I was in grade 10. He chucked me out of the house um, and I never forgave him for that until March 2009. I phoned him and I said to him that I forgive him for what he did. Two years later, he, he died of illness. So, now I'm on my way to recovery, and uh, with all this, he had me met a, a woman. He let me fall in love again. So, we got married in December the same year, but the Lord wasn't finished yet. Uh, he gave me a better job with a better salary, and today, he made me an owner of that business. I didn't have a vehicle, so he gave me a company vehicle. I smoked for 20 years. The one day, I just put it down, and I said, I'm done. Looking back now, you see all the steps that, that one has to go through. The money wasn't enough. The, the alcohol wasn't enough. Everything wasn't enough. Just because of one thing, the Lord wasn't there. I'm a better man now. Um, I'm a little bit wiser. He gave me the wisdom to not fall back to the ways that took me where I was down the dumps. He gave me everything back that I have now. And I realized that. to the end of himself, so he was picked up a book that he had looked at many months ago. And what made the difference to him? Was God, God's 
He asked for forgiveness. I told him that all the people asked forgiveness, people that his ex wife, his dad. Evidently, that relationship just didn't work. He was probably open to that, but how long that would be? But it takes two. Getting beyond ourselves. prophet, he had to get beyond himself. He was called when he was a young man. He wasn't very old. He was called as a prophet, and he says, I'm too young. I'm too young. I can't do it. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, he, God, God taught him, and he gave his life over to following God in his voice. He says, I warn you again. He's talking to the people of God. Stop running. Your feet are bare and your throat is dried out. He said, I can't help myself for I love these strange gods I am chasing after. That's what happened. That's what this guy, he, this guy, he started loving these strange gods. That's what happened in this clip. It says, my people are guilty of two evils. Say, two evils. Two evils. It's, it's simple if we can just boil this thing down instead of trying to do 50 million things. Two evils. They have abandoned me, the spring of living waters. God's not really the focus. He lost his focus. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, about focus is so important. They've abandoned me, the spring of living waters, and, and instead they settled for dead, stagnant water from cracked, leaky cisterns of their own making. We 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 settle for things that's not gonna that's not will not give us life. That will actually bring us down the wrong roads. And he goes on. So what do you hope to accomplish by going to Egypt and drinking from the waters of Nile? There, there's this, in the Bible, always says going down to Egypt. There's this aspect. It's always going down. If, we, if we're going away from God, we're going down. What do you hope to accomplish by going down there and getting involved in the world? What do you think you'll gain by traveling to Assyria, drinking from the waters of the Euphrates? It is your wickedness that will punish you and the desertion of my ways that will convict you. That's what happened to that guy. His wickedness punished him. With You know, if God is just, and he's a good God, how many know that built into sin is punishment? There's a sense of punishment built in to sin, to going the wrong way. This is, it's a building. Your wickedness is, I don't have to do it. Your wickedness is going to punish you. It will convict you. See the evil and taste the bitterness of forsaking the one true God, the eternal. At the core of this evil is the sad truth that you've forgotten the wonder and the terror of the God. Forgotten. Forgotten. times in the Bible does it talk about love? What do you think? Why, why is it talking about love so much? Because we forget. 
God actually loves us. He has, he has our best interest in mind more than anybody else, more than ourselves. You know, we, we, we need reinforcement. How deep do you want to go? Look to your neighbor and say, how deep do you want to go? I think one of the, one of the problems, and it's, history bears it out. The history, I, I took history, church history, when I was in seminary. History bears this out. This is the Christian life. What's the problem with many followers of Jesus? They don't go far enough. We get to a point and we stop. We just don't get far enough. That's what woke Martin Luther. sudden he could see. Because it used to be that the priests were the ones that really hurt God. Because back Martin Luther and prior, there was only one church. There wasn't a Catholic church and a Protestant church. It was just Catholic church at that time. And it was the priests that hurt God and you had to go through the priest, the church, the sacraments of the church to find grace and find God. You could not have a, you, the regular people could not have a personal relationship with him. Martin Luther had this revelation. You can have a personal relationship with God, you don't have to go through some priest. He, they can go far enough. What happened? Ezekiel here. It's actually the glorified Jesus that's talking to Ezekiel. If you read Ezekiel chapter 1, we're in, in, in our small group, we're, in, we're looking at the book of Revelation. The book of, in the book of Revelation, there's Jesus shows up in a vision to John, right? And it explains and it talks about this. Who Jesus, and Jesus, he's not the man Jesus, it's the glorified Jesus. It says that his face shone as bright as the sun. It's the same one that Ezekiel has met in Ezekiel chapter 1. And this whole book of Ezekiel is basically one vision where Jesus is talking to Ezekiel. It's not the man Jesus, it's the glorified Jesus. And here in Ezekiel 46, close to the end of the book, he says, Then he, Jesus, brought me back to the door of the house, and I saw water flowing from under the doorway towards the east. This is actually the throne room. If, if you get some different translations, but I chose this translation because it talks about 500 steps. Because, you go back to some of the translation, it talks about cubits. I don't know what a cubit is. I don't know. I, I know what 500 steps is. He brought me to the, the door of the house, which is the temple, and I saw water flowing from under the doorway towards the east, for the house looked toward the east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the house from the south of the altar. That the altar, that's where the that's where the temple is. And he brought me through the north gate and led me around the outside to the east gate. And I saw water coming from the south side, going towards the east. The man numbered five hundred long. Uh, the man numbered five hundred long steps. And he led me through the water, which covered my feet. Different people step into the water, and it's up to their ankles. Remember the first time you got your feet wet? Yeah, I think maybe I'll kind of open myself up to God. It's just in your ankles, but you know, you still can walk around. You're not, you're, not, you're not that deep yet. The passage goes on. And he numbered another 500 long steps and led me through water, which came up to my knees. He's getting deeper. It's up to his knees now. He numbered another 500 long steps and led me through the water. This time it came above my legs. It's up, it's up to the torso area. 
And he keeps going. And, he, and now, again, he numbered 500 long steps in a river that I could not walk through. The water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, and no one could cross it. And he said to me, son of man, do you see this? Then he brought me back to the side of the river. And when I returned, I saw that there were very many trees on both sides of the river. And he said, these waters go down out toward the east country, down to the, Arab, the Arabah, then flow to the Dead Sea. God's river wants to flow through you and I. We are to be in God's river. And what happens? Even the Dead Sea is become alive again. It goes on. When they, they flow into the sea and the waters there become clean again, every living thing that gathers where the river goes will live. Have you ever gotten over your head in Jesus? Have you given your whole heart? That was one of our songs. Our songs talked about I'm going to live my life. I'm going to give my whole heart. What's it mean to be over your head? You can't touch it. You, you just got to go with the stream. It's a flowing stream. What would it mean to go with God? To give up control. To go over your head. Well, that's getting beyond ourselves. We sort of want a relationship with Jesus, but I still want control. How many understand this? There's no control here. Jesus calls his disciples. He called his disciples back then, and he's calling his disciples now. On the banks of the Gennesaret Lake, a huge crowd, Jesus in the center that presses in to hear his message from God. Off to the side, fishermen were watching, washing their nets and leaving their boats unattended by the shore. Jesus gets into one of the boats and asks his son Simon, push him off uh, and anchor a short distance from the beach. So he got in the boat, he got out, and then people could gather around, and then he could he could talk to a larger crowd. The, the sound would just kind of bounce off the water. He could get a bigger crowd. Jesus sits down and teaches the people who were standing at the beach. After speaking for a while, Jesus speaks to Simon, and he says, Simon, move out into the deep water and drop your nets to see what you'll catch. They didn't catch anything. They were fishing all night. We are more open to suggestions when whatever we're doing ain't working. <laughs> we're more open. But here's They've never seen Jesus here at the lake. They know he's not a fisherman. He doesn't have the right accent. He's from somewhere else. They've never seen him. Move out into the deep water. What would life look like if you left the safety of, shallow, of a shallower life with Jesus and went over your head? following Jesus into the deep back. What would life look like if you heard his voice calling you to a deeper walk? Have you heard his voice calling you to a deeper walk? Have you heard his voice calling you to a deeper walk in him? What would happen if he would, he would want you to get out of the shell? We like to stay along the shore. It's safer. Isn't it? What would life look like if we would get over our head and go out to the deep place? Let's look at how Simon, Simon Peter, Simon perplexed, said, Master, we've been fishing all night. We even caught a minnow. But all right, I'll do it if you say so. Because here, this is a social scene. All the people are here. They're hearing Jesus teach the word. And he turns around to Peter and said, can you put your nets out into the deep place? I'm not sure what Peter had. He could have said, well, maybe 
and Jesus go fishing. You speak you. This is our arena. Your arena is teaching. But even though I would, you know, I'm thinking that Peter thought he was going to teach Jesus a lesson. That's what I think. Because let's just keep going. Then Simon gets his fellow fishermen to help him let down their nets. How do you think that went? Hey guys, let's go out to the deep. We were out here all night! We're tired. What is your... You see, you see the guy over there who told us to do this in front of everybody. And you know what? We're going to teach him a lesson. We're going to humble him. We've had all sorts of people come through here. All different kinds of teachers, all different kinds of what? Simon's the leader. He's probably he's, he's one of the leaders. They, they went along with him. I'm not sure how he got everybody to go along with him. Fishing all night? Not catch. We did. We know how to fish. You don't fish during the day. Hey, you fish at night. The fishies will come up to the surface then. You know, they're more apt to do that. It's not hot. It's not so hot up there. So the, the big fish come up then. I mean, there's different reasons for fishing at night. Simon gets his fellow fishermen help him let down their nets. And they're surprised the water is bubbling with thrashing fish, a huge school. How would you like to eat? I mean, it's just broiling with fish. Saying, wow, the strands of their nets start snapping under the weight of the catch. So the crew shout to the other boats, come out and help them. Hey, guys! How did you do? Come over here. We got the catch of the lifetime. It's not going to, hey, come on, trust me. They started scooping fish out of the nets and into their boats. So here they, they, they put the net and they start going, you know, putting it into the boat. And before long, the boats are so full of fish, they almost sink. I mean, I mean these are big boats, but there's, there's so much, I mean, Simon's fishing partners, James and John, two sons of two of Zebedee's sons, along with the rest of the fishermen, see this incredible haul of fish. They're all stunned. Especially Simon. How do you like that? Simon is stunned. He didn't think he was going to have This ain't. Jesus, I like you. And then he says, you shouldn't be around the likes of me. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be around people like me. Simon has judged himself. He says, you know, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be in the same room as you or walk with you. You're a whole different person than I. And then Jesus says this amazing thing. Don't be afraid, Simon. Don't Fears. 
Simon was not in control at all. Simon felt out of control. Simon saw himself. He doesn't like himself. That didn't seem to bother Jesus. Jesus knew that he was an imperfect man. Did that seem to bug him? It doesn't bother him that you don't have your act together. It doesn't bother him. So dive in. It's not about, it's okay. He'll walk with you wherever you're at. But you know what? I'm changing your life vision. It's not about fishing anymore. It's about reaching out to people. It's not about fishing anymore. It's not about, I'm not going to come into your life and make your life better. 